Today, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the work that we're doing to bring together uh, the ideas uh, in uh, the genome graph world with some of the ideas in uh, string compression. Um, everything I'm going to talk about uh, is joint work with Yutong Chu, and um, most of what I'm going to talk about uh, appeared in uh, our, our uh, ISMB 2021 paper. Uh, but towards the end, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that we're working on um, right now. Oops. Um, so uh, what I want to talk about uh, primarily is um, a new framework for genome graph construction that more closely exploits uh, the work that's been done in sequence compression in order to optimize the size of a uh, constructed genome graph. And uh, I'll, we'll also, I'll also draw um, sort of a natural connection between data compression and, and graph compression and, and introduce a, a couple of other uh, computational problems that we uh, identify uh, along the way. So um, there are many um, uh, definitions of genome graphs. We've heard uh, about uh, de Bruijn graphs um, a, a lot and, and, and variation graphs even today. Um, for our purposes and, and for the purposes of this talk, uh, I'm gonna think of a genome graph as a directed graph uh, that with uh, labels on uh, the nodes. And this directed graph stores some set of strings. Uh, by storing, we mean that uh, the string, each string in the set can be reconstructed by concatenating the node labels along an ST path in uh, G. Okay? And we call those paths that reconstruct the strings in set S the reconstruction paths. So here at the bottom is, is a, a small example of such a genome graph. Graph cycles are allowed. Um, um, string S1 is represented by the, the path um, that goes left to right, and uh, string S2 is represented by this uh, orange uh, path. So the, um, uh, this, is, this is the definition of genome graphs that, that we'll use. And, and why are genome graphs uh, kind of an interesting uh, data structure? Probably most people here um, uh, uh, are aware of all of the work that's, that's gone on in this area. But uh, the, the, the key problem that uh, genome graphs you know, aim to, or one of the key problems that genome graphs aim to, um, to help with is really large pangenomic uh, analyses. And that's because, of course, there are many um, uh, an ever-increasing uh, number of available genomes uh, from human and from other species, and we'd like to um, potentially analyze them uh, together uh, using exploiting all of that information. And so we need a genome, uh, some kind of data structure that uh, can store these very large collections of uh, related genomes. And genome graphs are, are uh, a good candidate for that data structure. And we'd also like to be able to operate on that uh, data structure uh, and uh, support efficient uh, analyses such as read mapping, variant calling, read alignment, and so forth uh, to, or uh, yeah, read alignment um, to the, uh, the genome graphs. Okay. There's a lot of work on, uh, you know, designing algorithms for these problems, and a lot of work on constructing efficiently um, various types of, of genome graphs. And I, I probably uh, omitted citing some of the, the work that's been talked about uh, even today, and, and I apologize for that, because there's a lot of work uh, in this area um, to try to build efficient uh, 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 genome graphs efficiently. And so that's really the problem we're gonna focus on uh, right now is that genome graphs are a, a natural data structure that stores a lot of the information that we get, that we are getting, uh, support, they support efficient analyses, and we'd like to be able to build them uh, efficiently. Okay. Well, what do we mean by efficient, efficiently? Um, obviously we want the construction process to be uh, computationally efficient. Uh, but we'd also like the genome graph at the end to be small. And we can think of this from going from the input data to the genome graph as itself a form of, of compression. And we'd like to get the smallest genome graph uh, as, as poss possible. And uh, so we have thousands of, uh, of genomes. We are going to adopt uh, this particular definition of the size of a genome graph. Uh, we're going to consider the size of the genome graph to be the number of nodes plus the number of edges in that graph, plus the length of the concatenated uh, node labels. And uh, there are many other definitions of graph size, of course, and, and um, you can imagine uh, uh, sort of novel genome graph size definitions, but this is a relatively intuitive one and, and what we'll use for um, what I'm talking about today. Okay. 
And we want the genome graph, this genome graph size to be small because, for example, uh, a number of the subsequent analyses that uh, people want to do to genome graphs, like mapping a sequence to the graph, uh, are the running time of those analyses are related to the size of the genome graph. So, for example, uh, Jane et al. in 2019 showed that sequence to graph mapping, uh, the running time of that was related to uh, the total size of the genome graph labels plus the number of edges times the length of the sequence you're trying to align. So this all this motivates the idea of trying to directly optimize uh, for the size of the genome graph. Construct a genome graph that encodes our sequences, but it's as small as possible. So uh, the naive or the first pass at that uh, does not work. Uh, um, if we take as our objective to minimize the size of G directly, um, without a little bit more technicality, we can end up in a trivial and uninteresting solution. Uh, here is a really small genome graph that encodes any sequence or any set of sequences, uh, and obviously is completely uninteresting. So uh, what we mean by the um, uh, a genome graph encoding a set of strings has to be, we have to be explicit in that we, we mean that we can only um, traverse each edge once for each string that's encoded in the genome graph. And that means that the number of edges will be approximately equal to the, the it will be related to the, um, the lengths and number of the strings that we want to store. And so naturally, um, we will simultaneously optimize for the graph size and reduce the number of uh, the length and total length of the reconstruction paths. Okay. So to uh, be more explicit, uh, we uh, are aiming to construct small uh, restricted genome graphs where each edge can be traversed um, at most once. Parallel edges between nodes are allowed. Um, and the, 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 since we can only traverse each node at most once, reconstruction paths use uh, distinct sets of edges. Okay. So that's, that's our goal for all the reasons that genome graphs are, are useful um, and why we want them to be small. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, for the, the for many of you will be a, kind of a re reminder of uh, a particular compression scheme uh, called the external pointer macro scheme uh, introduced in 1982 by Storer. And um, the idea behind this is that we are going to encode uh, some uh, string T. So this has nothing to do with genome graphs. It's just a general string T um, as a um, compressed string that consists of the concatenation of a reference string and uh, a sequence of pointers into that reference string, where here uh, the pointer means uh, a location and a length. It's a substring into um, uh, the reference. Okay, and it's called an external pointer macro scheme because um, the uh, we have this external reference we can refer to, or we must refer to. So let me give you a quick example of decoding. Uh, uh, a string compressed with the external pointer macro scheme. Um, here is uh, in gray the reference. Uh, a this T part of the compression is a sequence of those pointers, and uh, these pointers give us substrings in R, and we concatenate those substrings to get the the reconstruction. So the first pointer here represents DCGA, uh, and so on. Okay, and so this is how the external pointer macro scheme uh, works. Well, uh, there's a really close connection uh, between this external pointer macro scheme and uh, genome graphs. And um, suppose we have a genome graph here, like the small example we saw before. Oops, wrong direction, sorry. Um, we can uh, concatenate those node labels and think of that concatenation as our reference. And we can think of um, nodes, the labels of the nodes as pointers into that reference. So now we have the reference, we have the pointers, the sequence of pointers uh, it, um, can be re reconstructed from uh, the edges in the, the genome graph. So edges in the genome graph uh, correspond to adjacencies uh, in the sequence of pointers in the EPM comp compressed string. So we have the reference, we have uh, the sequence of pointers that encodes uh, a set of strings. And here um, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I, uh, when we, talk about the compression, you know, we're thinking about compressing a single string. We talk about the genome graph, we're thinking about encoding a set of strings. 
but these are really, I'm just assuming these are kind of equivalent. We can separate, we can concatenate the set of strings separated by unique characters um, to uh, obtain a single string. Um, now the connection between EPM and um, uh, genome graphs is actually much tighter. In fact, uh, we can transform between the two uh, computationally efficiently. Um, so let's look at just one direction, transforming from a compressed string to a genome graph. And we really kind of do the, op the inversion, inverse of what uh, I just showed on the previous um, slide. We um, create the nodes by cutting the reference string um, uh, according to the boundaries of the pointers. So in this situation, we have the first pointer goes from position one to position four. So we think of sort of chopping the reference up here uh, after position zero and after position four, okay? And we do the same thing with this. Uh, here we are gonna chop up between two and three, and that's gonna break up uh, this node. And then we're gonna chop up between five and six, and that's gonna break up uh, this node. Okay, and lastly, uh, seven, two is this, and that's gonna break up this node. So from the sequence of pointers, we get our nodes and their labels. Uh, and then we um, walk down the um, sequence of pointers, connecting um, edges, uh, connecting nodes with edges, uh, according to adjacencies between the pointers or from within or um, adjacencies that are contained within that uh, pointer substring. So um, here we have uh, the um, well, the reference path we kind of assume is there, uh, and that's always going to be spelled out by this concatenation of uh, the or the linear sequence of the nodes we just created. And uh, then for uh, to create the path for for t, um, we look at first the first pointer spans um, this these um, two nodes t c and g a. So we add an edge. Uh, the next um, pointer after that is three three. Uh, and that is uh, starts at the GA edge. So we're here. We want to go to this GA node, which is uh, self-loop, actually, in this case. Then following uh, the GA, there's a T. That's uh, adjacency that's contained within a pointer. So that's a T. Uh, and then uh, the next adjacency goes from where we are, T, to uh, GA. And so we can reconstruct the path. And in fact, you can implement it so you can reconstruct the path. Uh, in essentially, uh, well, in linear time, uh, the length of the reference plus the length of your output. Okay. Uh, one uh, side note that gives you a kind of an interesting problem is that there are often several equivalent options for encoding the pointer uh, in EPM. So we saw that here with, G with GA. Uh, in, this, in the example I just did, GA um, was, uh, the, to encode GA, we used uh, this pointer here. But there's a, another instance of GA. And if we, we had instead used that instance of GA, we would have gotten a different set of nodes slightly, and in fact, a smaller set of nodes. And uh, so in fact, this choice, uh, but exactly the same length uh, compressed string. So uh, this choice of nodes can't, this choice of sources can affect the number of nodes and the size of the genome graph that you get, which leads to an interesting problem of um, what we call the source assignment problem which is to choose from among possible encodings uh, for your pointers, uh, the, the encodings that minimize the number of cuts um, in the reference uh, string. Uh, I don't have time to talk about that uh, today, but I, um, there are some details in the paper, although there's a lot of room for improving uh, the approach that we have. So uh, we can convert between um, uh, compressed strings and genome graphs in linear time. Uh, we can go the other way as well. But the, the um, relationship is even tighter, which is that um, we can uh, find a function f uh, of variable of um, characteristics or sizes of, in the compressed form. So the size of the reference, um, the length of the compressed string, the number of unique pointers that are inside of t. And we can upper bound the size of the um, graph that's produced and uh, through this algorithm that I just kind of highlighted. And we can go the other way as well. We can upper bound the size of the compressed string if you take a genome graph and uh, use it to convert, uh, to create a compressed uh, EPM string. And so what this, uh, it, pursuing our goal of um, small genome graphs, we have a, a really uh, nice relationship here, which is that if we can find a space efficient compressed string, 
in the EPM form, we are guaranteed a space efficient uh, genome graph. Right? Although, oops, although in either case, um, it, it, it's not necessarily optimal, um, the genome graph that you produce. Okay, so how can we exploit this uh, connection? Um, the idea here is that we're going to get to creating a genome graph through going through an EPM compression scheme. Once we have a compressed string in that scheme, we can use a, the C to G algorithm to create a genome graph. And so the question is, what uh, EPM method should we use? Really, uh, the algorithm works for any EPM compression algorithm, of course. Um, but a, a natural one to choose uh, in this uh, context is um, the relative lempel Z. Uh, uh, heuristic. EPM in general, uh, the minimization problem of finding the smallest compressed string under this scheme uh, is NP hard. Um, but the relative lempel ziv uh, is, uh, the idea is that you uh, apply the lempel ziv algorithm, but rather than um, allowing yourself to point back to parts of the input string that you have um, seen already, you are always forced to um, refer back to the reference. Okay, and that's what makes an external pointer um, macro scheme and also uh, fits it into this framework. And this is really nice because we often do have a reference that like human genome, that's uh, uh, a good um, dictionary to use for the compression. And uh, there's it's linear uh, running time. And um, uh, uh, it's been shown that um, there are, um, it, it provides good compression, at least empirically on, on many genomic sequences. And there is a lot of work on efficient um, sequence query indices for these and related um, types of compression. So we're gonna use uh, uh, for our kind of proof of concept, um, uh, this relative lempel ziv compression scheme. Uh, the idea is that uh, we will apply this pipeline with that, but it really could be any other compression scheme. So uh, that's um, the, the the key idea here in this uh, part of the talk is that correspondence and convertibility, both in terms of uh, information content and in terms of uh, size of uh, EPM compressed strings and uh, genome graphs. And um, in order to test whether this kind of works uh, reasonably well in practice, uh, we implemented this, this idea in what we call RLZ graph. Um, and and uh, we conducted some tests. Um, uh, the idea behind the test is that we um, um, take a collection of um, genomes, actually, co sorry, collection of variants and a reference genome, and uh, use these variants to produce a set of complete genomic sequences, uh, because the input to RLZ graph is, is complete genomic sequences instead of uh, variant calls. And uh, we'll run RLZ graph and uh, a colored compact color to Brun graph creator uh, Bifrost um, uh, on uh, those uh, sequences. And we'll also um, look at the performance of uh, sort of an optimized uh, variant graph um, construction approach, uh, VG, uh, VG toolkit. Uh, VG um, does not take in complete strings or in the way we, we ran it, it takes in variants directly. And so we skip the step here of um, sort of unpacking the variants into complete strings. So this is, this is the setup. Um, we, uh, on the graph, uh, graph shown here, these are 32 samples of chromosome one from the um, Human Genome Structural Variant Consortium, uh, a Human Genome Structural Variant Consortium data set, uh, which has a lot of uh, genomic variants and rearrangements. And um, on the uh, left is a plot of the total number of characters uh, in the graphs produced. And for uh, compacted to brown graphs for various sizes, uh, for VG and for RLZ graph. And you can see that, uh, you know, both VG and RLZ graph have the same uh, number of characters. Um, and the reason for this is they both use the reference string as the, as the backbone. So the total sum of the node labels is never going to be bigger uh, for RLZ graph for, than the reference string and the similar for VG. And uh, when you look at uh, space usage um, overall, measured as, uh, in this, as the size of the GFA file, which is a common um, uh, file format, you'd see that uh, while VG does uh, achieve a slightly or a, a smaller size, uh, RLZ graph is, is pretty competitive with that. And um, I, I guess I want to stress without sounding defensive that, you know, this was not an optimized approach to construct variant graphs. This is literally running relative lempel ziv and then converting that into a genome graph. And um, 
already the uh, the size is pretty uh, similar to VG, and uh, VG had the advantage that it only has to it had variants called uh, called variants handed to it, and RLZ graph discovered all those variants quote unquote uh, automatically. Um, I will also uh, really important to note here that you know neither VG nor uh, Bifrost uh, are aiming to uh, produce explicitly the smallest graph possible. They have many other considerations. I mean, for the color to burn graph, of course, there's a there's no minimization problem. The size of it is the size uh, that uh, of that structure, um, and so really that is uh, provided here as sort of a uh, scale function, you know, uh, to give a sense of scale comparing the other two. Um, uh, yeah, so there are many other considerations besides size, and so it's not a completely, um, uh, you know, fair comparison between the two. Uh, similarly, with running time, again, uh, with comparing with a optimized uh, um, and really nice color to burn graph creation method, uh, RLZ graphs, you know, single threaded uh, is uh, doesn't take too long to to run. And I think the point here is not so much the running time, but the fact that um, there's a lot of opportunity and potential for making this be very uh, practical. Um, so uh, with that, I, I uh, want to shift gears uh, to the to a, a more recent set of work, which is um, thinking about kind of counterbalancing this idea of uh, creating the smallest graph. And um, size is just one criteria for genome graph construction, and it may not be uh, the, the most appropriate one. Um, Another criteria is, you know, maybe to think about um, constructing a genome graph so that you encode a set of strings with the right amount of uh, lossiness or expressiveness. So what, what do I mean by that? Um, we can think about uh, this set of strings here, this red dot represents the set of strings we actually want to encode with our, with our genome graph. So that's the, um, uh, you know, thousand genomes uh, project data or, or, or whatever. And uh, we typically, in that setting, would want to construct a genome graph that didn't just represent the 3,000 people in the 1,000 Genomes Project. We would like it to use those people as a uh, representative set that allows us to describe a larger set that hopefully approximates you know, human variation. And so that is this green set here. This is the desired set of strings we want to represent. But when we construct a, uh, a genome graph, um, you know, using RLZ or, any, or essentially any other graph, uh, we don't really get any say over this uh, green uh, box. And the genome graph represents um, some set of strings, okay, and typically much larger than the set of strings we want uh, where we uh, want to represent. Okay? And uh, so the question is, can we? Um, Say something about uh, this expressiveness and potentially use it to uh, uh, again as a criteria for um, uh, uh, genome graph construction. And uh, in order to do to do that, we'd have to we have to define uh, what we mean by expressiveness. And uh, one way to get at it, and I'm, I believe there are many, is what we call the string universe diameter. And so we can think of each one of the uh, this universe of String sets that are represented by a genome graph is is here. And each one of these points is a um, string set, and the um, string universe diameter of this uh, graph G is the max over string sets that are represented by that graph of the earth movers edit distance between those string sets. So the earth movers edit distance is the earth movers distance, which is the um, total cost to transform one probability distribution into another. Um, uh, using the edit distance as uh, the ground metric. So the amount of changing one item in your probability distribution to another item, uh, that the cost of that is the edit distance between those two items. Okay. And this uh, string universe diameter gives us a estimate of how much, how expressive our genome graph uh, is. Okay. And um, one application of these, uh, these diameters uh, is in comparing uh, genome graphs. So um, uh, we, in in many settings, we we don't we, the natural uh, unit of information is the genome graph or a set of sequences. So if we sequence a cancer tumor, 
we assume there are very heterogeneous sequences in that uh, in that sample, and um, uh, we are only seeing fragments of the underlying genomes. So we have this collection of heter of fragments from heterogeneous sequences natural to build a genome graph that encodes that variation and the um, um, overlaps between those observed sequences. So for every, say, tumor sample, we have a genome graph that encodes that heterogeneity of, of sequences in the tumor sample. Okay? But now you may want to cluster uh, tumor samples, uh, visualize them by embedding them, um, uh, subtype them, and so forth. And to do that, you'd need a distance measure between these uh, genome graphs representing your tumor samples. Um, and there's a uh, really um, uh, fantastic uh, uh, paper on uh, introducing this algorithm called GTED um, that uh, essentially finds the closest distance between uh, Eulerian tours represented in your genome graphs uh, according to the edit distance. The two Eulerian tours from your two genome graphs uh, with the smallest uh, edit distance. Um, and that's uh, uh, called uh, GTED. Uh, but what we really want to do often is compare the distance between the unknown and unseen true genome sequences that launched these genome graphs uh, by being in sample in, in real life. Okay. And um, so these are two different measures, one of which we can't compute because we don't know what the actual underlying sequences are and one of which we can uh, compute. Okay, and um, one of the things that I won't have time to go into detail in any of this uh, work on expressiveness, but um, we, we can show that using those string universe diameters that I talked about uh, on the last slide, we can bound the difference between these two uh, measures when comparing genome graphs. And uh, through some empirical experimentation, we can actually uh, correct um, this uh, difference um, in, uh, in, in practice. And as I mentioned in the future, uh, it would be nice to um, use these, this diameter as uh, another constraint on uh, genome graph cons construction, counterbalancing this uh, uh, compression. So uh, uh, to conclude you know, and summarize, uh, I really hope uh, I uh, clearly explained this kind of interesting connection between uh, small compression uh, string creation and genome graph cre creation. Um, the um, main interesting point here, the takeaway I, I think is not just uh, the, the specific algorithms that um, I talked about, but the fact that rather than uh, you know, reinventing uh, genome graph construction methods, uh, there may be a lot of really interesting um, uh, approaches that adapt much more directly ideas from compression to converting to genome graphs. Um, and uh, um, uh, we gave a proof of concept uh, implementation of one sort of uh, implementation uh, uh, or one sort of instantiation of this scheme. Um, and uh, lastly, talked a little bit about uh, some of our much more recent work on uh, trying to uh, get a handle on quantify and limit in the appropriate way uh, genome graph um, expressiveness um, and uh, uh, through the use of uh, these string universe diameters. Uh, so with that, I uh, want to thank uh, the organizers again uh, and uh, for um, uh, inviting inviting me and thank my uh, co-author Yutong and uh, the funding here and uh, also you all for listening.